You're listening to The Globalist, first broadcast on the 29th of October 2021 on Monocle 24. The Globalist, in association with UBS. This is The Globalist, coming to you live from Midori House in London. I'm Georgina Godwin. On the show ahead, as the world's 20 richest nations prepare to meet in Rome, we look at the agenda and what it signifies for next week's COP26 gathering in Glasgow. Then... As we have said repeatedly, any changes to the transitional government by force in Khartoum puts at risk US assistance. We examine the situation in Sudan following the military coup on Monday. Plus, we welcome an Afghan former politician to the studio and hear her story. We'll also flick through the day's newspapers, get the latest business headlines, and Andrew Muller will be on hand to reflect on the news cycle. We also learned, and conclusively so, that if people are not enticed by the offer of a free, safe protection against the worst ravages of a potentially fatal disease, they're not going to be enticed by much. That's all ahead here on The Globalist, live from London. First, a look at what else is happening in the news. Moscow's shops, restaurants and schools have closed as Russia battles a record COVID caseload. Facebook has changed its corporate name to Meta as part of a major rebrand of the social media giant. And the Spanish train operator, Renfe, has announced plans to open a service between London and Paris. Stay tuned to Monocle 24 throughout the day for more on those stories. Now, the G20 summit takes place in Rome this weekend and world leaders are already heading to Italy for the gathering that represents 60% of the world's population and more than 80% of its economic output. Less exclusive than the G7, its countries have disparate economic goals and radically different political systems. Finding common ground may prove increasingly difficult, particularly if the US and China continue to settle into their roles as opposing superpowers. Well, we're joined on the line from Rome by the journalist Megan Williams and also in the studio by Charles Hecker of Control Risks. Uh, Megan, if we could start with you, looming large on the agenda must surely be COVID-19. Can the leaders agree on how to support poorer countries with vaccine rollout? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the main issues on the agenda this weekend. And so far, there's not um, there's not a great agreement to the World Health Organization, as well as um, some some former world leaders and humanitarian organizations have called on the G20 leaders to dramatically scale up the manufacturing and access of the vaccines to help the poorer countries. Um, and so, uh, you know, this has been an issue. Rich countries originally promised that any successful vaccine would would be what they referred to as sort of a go- global public good. And they pledged almost 2 billion doses to developing countries. But, you know, here we are a year later and just 14 percent of that amount, about 260 million have been delivered um, and only, you know, less than 2 percent of people living in really poor countries um, have been fully vaccinated. Well, as in you know, Europe and other places, it's, it's more than 60 percent. So um, they have not come up, you know, they have not come up with a with a document, a pledge yet that specifically promises ways of, of reaching that. And the hope is that they'll get something firmer out of uh, the weekend's meeting. Mm. Now, there are many rifts that need to be healed. Last month, when the US, the United Kingdom and Australia announced their new security partnership, AUKUS, it wasn't just China that was angered, but France too. Uh, Charles, US President Joe Biden's expected to meet his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, for the first time since that spat. Do you think relations can be patched up? I do. I mean, you have to think that, first of all, the ambassador has been returned to Washington. A lot of the heat and a lot of the emotion 
emotion has come out of the relationship. And if you recall the meeting at the G7 in Cornwall in June this year, um, the two leaders exhibited an extremely warm personal relationship. What will probably happen on the sidelines is that we'll see Macron press Biden on the AUKUS deal and try to sort of squeeze some concessions out of him, either on the shape of the deal, the size of the deal, or the pace of its implementation. Um, Macron has a domestic audience to play to. He's going to have to be, you know, strong man. But this is a chance for them to put things back on the right track. Mm. And, and what of China, Megan? I mean, President Xi hasn't left China since the pandemic began. Will he participate virtually? Yes, I, I think China has confirmed that he will participate virtually. He's going to give a speech. Uh, the the foreign minister will be there as well. I mean, that, you know, this is really important that China's on board on this. It's the you know the world's biggest CO to producer. Uh, and the fact that he, he won't come could indicate that the country uh, is, is no, no longer willing to make any more concessions on the issue. Uh, China says it will aim to reach net zero emissions by 2060. Um, it's, still, it's still burning coal and, and building uh, coal burning facilities. So, um, of course, the, the, the rest of the world would would like to get um, would like that to stop sooner um, but the fact that he's not actually coming um, doesn't uh, doesn't augur that well for for that happening mm. uh, Charles looking at this from a US perspective Biden's hoping to move forward on an agreement for global minimum corporation tax that's currently on his agenda back home uh, and also I mean energy prices will will be under discussion the Iran nuclear deal and supply chain issues I mean, can they hope to get through all of this and, and reach any kind of uh, deal? I think the quick answer to that is no. Um, that's a very, very ambitious agenda for what is a very, very messy G20 meeting where we're going to have some people dialing in and some people in person. I think the primary accomplishment that will come out of this meeting is this agreement on the global minimum corporate tax. There was a meeting of the G20 finance ministers prior to the meeting in Rome, and they ironed out all of the last minute details. That will probably be the signature accomplishment. The rest of it will move forward incrementally. And then really, it's on to COP26. Yeah. I mean, just as you say, the, the kind of backroom deal, that's what these things are really about. This kind of flourish of leaders arriving and red carpets and speeches, that's kind of meaningless when it comes to agreements signed on paper, isn't it? Um, that's right. And and you don't get this sort of, you're not going to have, among all of the members of the G20, you're not going to have that in-person camaraderie and the and the sideline chats and the, and the meetings in the corridors because Putin's not coming, Xi Jinping is not coming, uh, Mexico is not being represented by AMLO. Uh, so there'll be some chit chat on the sides. The rest of it's going to have to be on Skype, I guess. Yeah. Um, Megan, how is the summit currently being viewed in Italy? Well, I mean, it, you know, the vast majority of Italians, like I think a, a lot of majority of Europeans and many people around the world want more action on climate change. So, um, you know, I think this this summit uh, and certainly the issues that are being discussed at the summit um, are, are considered very important to Italians. Uh, Italy endorses the UN goal of limiting global warming warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, and certainly Italy's um, Prime Minister Mario Draghi wants to get a firm commitment by by mid-century uh, for, to 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 stop the you know to have a net zero. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, I think Italians are, are, are backing this. I don't know. I mean, it's a huge deal here in Rome, obviously, with logistics, um, organizing it. Um, there, there were border controls that have been temporarily reintroduced. Uh, huge swaths of the city are being roped off. Um, uh, some more subways are closed. I mean, a lot of subways are closed in Rome anyway because it's it's uh, it's such a dysfunctional city. You know, there's an elevator breaks in the subway. Um, the, the subway station stays closed literally for two years. I mean, there are two subways like that uh, right now. So it's not a city that is known for um, let's say s smooth smooth logistics and smooth functioning. But um, you know, so far it seems it seems to be well prepared for possible protests and, and planned protests as well. 
So, uh, you know, let's just hope it, it all goes well. So far, so good. And in terms of Mario Draghi, is his setting of the agenda of the summit helping his standing at home? Well, he has a pretty firm standing. I, I think so. I mean, it, I think it's just a relief to a lot of Italians to have uh, a political leader who seems to be, well, who, who is very experienced, who is mature, who is calm. Uh, he, Italy, you know, had many years of, of the opposite. It, it's, it's had, uh, it's flirted with uh, the far right recently, although municipal elections seem to have um, have reversed that trend. It seems to be going more center left now. Uh, Mario Draghi is a centrist, and I think most Italians are just relieved to have someone in place. Uh, who can represent the country and give some political stability for now. Mm. Uh, Charles, uh, the G20 forum is taking place right before the, the major UN summit on climate change in Glasgow. Do you think that this Rome summit will be a litmus test as to the success or failure of COP26? Um, it will be a preview as to how well it goes. I mean, what the G20 members are supposed to do at this meeting is resubmit their pledges um, to curtail their contribution to global emissions. Four G20 members, or at least as of, as of the last moment that I looked at this, four G20 members have yet to submit um, their emissions reduction pledges. Um, five G20 members have not increased their ambitions uh, for emissions reduction. And so if you want to have every T crossed and every I dotted before you sort of slam into COP26 after the G20, that's not going to happen. There's still a lot of work to do in Glasgow. Charles Hecker, thank you very much indeed. And please do stay with us because I think you're going to come back a little bit later to have a look through the newspaper front pages with me. Uh, and many thanks also to Megan Williams in Rome. This is The Globalist on Monocle 24. The Foreign Desk is Monocle 24's weekly global affairs programme. We tackle the world's biggest news stories, as well as those left untold. If actually though you speak to the ordinary people, their aspirations is for a unified country, whether you talk to business people, to school teachers, to market traders, and so on and so forth, across the board, is they want to see their country recreated as it was, only this time as a democratic, accountable system. Our expert guests offer in-depth analysis and first-hand and experience. In one of the Ebola treatment centres I went to had been burned down by a community that were very resentful and frightened of Ebola and they still have a bunker in the middle. They've dug a big deep bunker where they can hide if people come and shoot at them. The Foreign Desk with me, Andrew Muller, is available every Saturday from midday London time, right here on Monocle 24. On Monday, a coup derailed Sudan's fragile transition towards democracy following the removal of longtime ruler Omar al Bashir in April 2019 in a popular uprising. Since then, the ruling military has sacked six ambassadors and security forces have tightened their crackdown on pro democracy protesters. The African Union has announced its decision to suspend Sudan from the bloc's activities until the restoration of the country's civilian led transitional government, while the United States paused. $700 million in emergency assistance and the World Bank has frozen aid. Well, to catch up with all of these developments, I'm joined by the Sudanese-Australian writer and broadcaster Yasmin Abdul-Majid. Uh, Yasmin, thanks so much for joining us. We understand that there's been considerable pushback on the ground. What can you tell us about protests on the streets in Sudan? Thanks, Georgina. Yes, in Everyone in Sudan or many, many folks in Sudan um, have pushed back. And it's quite interesting because I think it's been difficult to get information, obviously, because the Internet has been cut. And though it was briefly restored on Tuesday, um, getting information from the ground has been challenging. However, it's very, very clear that civilians are not at all interested in a return to military rule. And they've been coming out in full force, and in fact, also in preparation for uh, what's being called a millions march on October the 30th. So although folks have been coming out every day since the coup on Monday, there's been a big push around the country and organizing happening in 
very old school manners, people organizing in the neighborhoods, people creating roadblocks just made out of bricks and, and pots and whatever else they can find to, in order to stop um, military and someone coming into their neighborhoods. Also speaking um, of a general strike. So a general strike has continued over the last few days where most folks are not going to work. So services like um Petroleum, healthcare, pharmacies, markets have all largely been closed. A few space, a few small places here and there um, to allow people to get food and so on, the very basic necessities. But generally, uh, folks on the ground are saying we do not want a return to military rule and we will make it as difficult as possible for this country to function until there is some sort of return to civilian rule. So it, it's very interesting to see how, how things are progressing. Uh, and let's have a look at the World Bank now. I mean, how significant is the suspension of aid coupled with the US pause in emergency assistance worth $700 million? It's quite significant, Georgina, because it's only been very recently that Sudan has even been able to access any of the World Bank's aid. So it had billions, over $50 billion in um, arrears. And only in June, I think, 2021, was were they able to... Um, start accessing World Bank funding again by, um, I think that it reached what's called a heavily indebted poor countries decision point, which enabled $50 billion of that external debt to be cleared and only about $6 billion of debt remaining, which was going to be able to be cleared over the next three years, allowing Sudan to be able to access over $2 billion of grants for the first time in 30 years. So this aid was supposed to be able to support agriculture, transport, healthcare, education, and was a, an enormous step, I think, for people on, on the ground who have been really, really suffering, not able to get basics like power and food and medicine and so on. So, in, and also I should say the payment of these arrears was made possible through a, a bridge fund, a $1.15 billion bridge fund from the United States government. So, a number of external and international bodies were interested in helping the civilian or the transitional government sort of take the next step. So for all of these grants to be paused, it's going to be very difficult for the Sudanese military's supporters, whether it's, you know, Egypt and the UAE and Saudi and so on, who generally are more supportive of a military government than a civilian one, especially in Sudan, it's going to be difficult for them to be able to replace all of the funding that the that the military and is now losing through um, the World Bank and, and the US and so on pausing their funding. So mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. That, that's the current situation. It is very, very significant. Uh, and, and it's good, but I have to say fairly unusual to see the African Union taking action. What, what has the bloc said? The bloc has uh, suspended membership, Sudan's membership, over the quote-unquote unconstitutional seizure of power. And it is, as you say, quite unusual. Um, the African Union doesn't usually take such strong steps like this. And so I, I believe, and it's quite, um, people are taking hope from the fact that Almost all international bodies are condemning what is happening in Sudan, condemning the military coup, condemning the fact that this is an unconstitutional uh, move and so on. So I think that is giving the civilian protesters hope, even though right now they are still pe they're peaceful protesters. The protests in Sudan since 2019 and, and earlier has been peaceful. And although they are facing um, military on the ground using live ammunition, using, ki I mean, kidnapping people, arresting people and so on. Um, the hope is that all of this international pressure will show the military government or the military at the moment that there is no further option for them to, to without a civilian um, government and move forward. And, and do you think this million march on Saturday will spark more violence? I think, unfortunately, um, what we have seen from Sudan, from the Sudanese military, is that when you have um, a lack of or blocked internet access, I mean, the last time that Sudan, uh, that the military blocked internet access was just ahead of the June 3 massacre in 2019. So there is deep concern um, from, from, everybody really that the fact that there is no internet access or very disrupted internet access the fact that the military doesn't seem to be interested um in stepping down uh, general borhan has not made any moves towards um stepping down in fact 
he has sort of said, oh, I'm speaking to Prime Minister Hamdok about him joining our government and so on. Um, there is deep concern that there will be, there has already been violence. I think the, la- the last numbers, there are about 11 people have been killed um, and over 170 have been injured just in the protests over the mm. last few days and just from what we've been able to hear. So yes, the concern is that there will be violence and also a concern that we will not be able to know about all of the violence because of the lack of access to internet and information. So it is definitely something that that many, many of us are concerned about. Uh, and the lack of international observers. What, what can you tell us about these diplomats being expelled? Yes, so there have been a number of diplomats been expelled. In fact, um, there's also uh, the General Burhan suspended a number of um, or fired a number of ambassadors as well internationally, uh, which is ironic because I'm not sure he actually has the power to fire anybody. Um, But essentially, it's been incredibly difficult. Um, The the. Airport was closed, um, although there have been reports of some uh, planes being able to leave in recent um, days or in recent hours, I should say. But it is it is difficult um, to get any real sense of what's going on on the ground because because of a lack of of international observers, because a lack. I mean, the U.S. had just had a meeting with folks in Sudan over the weekend, um, but that oversight, I think, is is no longer really being able to be counted on. So, yes. Yasmin, thank you very much indeed. That was the writer and broadcaster Yasmin Abdul-Majid. Now, still to come on the programme, we'll unpack the day's newspapers, review the business headlines, and Andrew Muller will offer us his quirky take on the week's news stories. The friendless poindexters at the NBER, we learned, have been having a look into vaccine incentives. These have included, but been by no means limited to, cash, lottery tickets, concert tickets, holiday vouchers, a chance to win a car in a raffle, beer, marijuana, fishing licences, pickled herring, popcorn, chickens, and in Finland, buckets. This is The Globalist. Stay tuned. UBS has over 900 investment analysts from over 100 different countries. Over 900 of the sharpest minds and freshest thinkers in the world of finance today. To find out how we could help you, contact us at UBS.com. Well, it's time now for a letter from New York City. This week, Monocle's correspondent in the Big Apple, Henry Reese Sheridan, runs a much-needed background check on Senator Joe Manchin. Senator Joe Manchin has informed has Democratic, Democratic leaders that he will accept the spending bill. Because of opposition from Senator Joe Manchin. President Joe Biden has been frustrated. He's been frustrated by Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia. The president needs Manchin's support to pass a bill that would fund some really big domestic policies. Biden wants to spend loads of money on infrastructure, climate change and social programs, but to do that, he's got to raise the dosh. Biden's latest plan to fund his proposals is a so-called billionaire's tax. Without going into too much detail, it would work by taxing the 700 very wealthiest people in America. Manchin says he doesn't like the idea of targeting these people. To expand social programs when you have trust funds that aren't solvent, they're going insolvent. He considers them to be job creators who contribute enough to society as it is. It's an unusual position for a Democrat. I want to find out where Manchin is coming from, so I decide to research him. I open Manchin's Wikipedia page. I'm quickly distracted away from substantive investigation by two bizarre biographical facts. First, Manchin's surname is apparently derived from the Italian name Mancini, Mancini, which according to Google Translate literally means giant chin the size of a human, but the only human features it has is arms and legs, otherwise it's literally just a massive chin. Second, Manchin is a member of the Congressional Friends of Wales Caucus. The group was set up in 2014 to strengthen business and cultural ties between the US and Wales. 
There are nine members, seven in the House and two in the Senate. Some of them seem to have Welsh heritage. Almost all of them represent constituencies where mining is a prominent industry, as it has been in Welsh history. Man. So Manchin is one of only two senators in the Congressional Friends of Wales caucus. I can't find any evidence that he's of Welsh heritage, as we've established, he's of Italian extraction. His state of West Virginia is a mining state, but could there be more to the Manchin Wales connection than that? I read further down the wiki for the Congressional Friends of Wales caucus. In 2015, the group sent five congresspeople as the first ever US congressional delegation to Wales. Their destination? My hometown, Swansea, Wales' second biggest city. Thrilling to the sensation of falling down an internet rabbit hole, I Google Manchin, Swansea. Manchin, Swansea. The second result on the first page is an article from businesslive.co.uk. It's written by Sean Barry, who has the title Media Wales Business Editor, and it's dated 25th of October this week. It reports on the progress of a £1.7 billion plan to create an energy-gathering tidal lagoon in Swansea Bay. Supporters of the plan claim that it will create thousands of jobs connected to an on-site battery factory and data centre powered by the lagoon. It's called the Blue Eden Project and it's being spearheaded by a Welsh company called DST Innovations. I know about the Lagoon plan. It's been knocking around in various forms for years and is highly controversial because of its potential negative impact on the natural environment. What I didn't know is that DST Innovations has hatched a plan to build a second battery factory that would be a sister facility to the Swansea one in West Virginia. And guess who's rubber stamped to the deal? The US Welsh tie-up, Barry writes, has the backing of Democrat Senator for West Virginia, Joe Matchin. I reread that sentence to check. Matching. The article has indeed misspelled Joe Manchin's name, Matchin. It gives me no pleasure to point this out, but there are standards of journalistic professionalism we all have to live by. Whatever you think of his politics, you've got to respect the man's name. Anyway, the article goes on to point out that Senator Manchin is also chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. It quotes him calling the deal a shining example of global collaboration working at its best, delivering innovative solutions that sustain jobs in our communities. So that's what this is all about. Manchin's been in my backyard playing pork barrel politics. Friend of Wales? Are you really our friend, Joe Manchin, or are we merely your friend with benefits? Are you just in it for the batteries? My advice to President Joe Biden takes a form of a question, and the question is this. With friends like Joe Manchin, who needs enemies? Manchin. Manchin. Many thanks there to Henry Rees Sheridan in New York. Let's continue now with today's newspapers. And joining me back in the studio is Charles Hecker, senior partner at Control Risks. Good morning, Georgina. Uh, so uh, let's have a look. Uh, war with France was that on your <laughs> was that on your agenda? Right on my bingo card for 2021 <laughs> what was was not you know armed military conflict between the United Kingdom and the Republic of France. Um, but if you look at today's papers, particularly the slightly more Brexit supporting papers, you will see on the front page, massive type font. Um, and, and we look at the Times here on page one. French ambassador hauled in over seizure of British trawler. And, and I kind of think that this is important to talk about so that we can stop talking about it. There is a major international dispute brewing over something that accounts for a fraction of 1% of GDP, both in France and in the UK. Um, you know, really astonishing. So, yes, there was a seizure of a boat that was fishing in the wrong waters. Both countries are meant to be exchanging licenses to allow each other's boats into certain waters, particularly the waters that they've been fishing prior to Brexit. And that's not happening fast enough. And so, you know, cue the sort of Sturm und Drang, um, or I suppose I should be using French words instead of German <laughs> words for explaining this. But in any case... Um, Major dust up between Paris and London. 
Uh, and it's extraordinary when you when you look at what else is going on that they're fighting over this in waters that are polluted. Uh, <laughs> By sewage, knowingly polluted by sewage. That's right. Actually, I think the UK has finally decided that it is a bad idea to pump raw, untreated human waste into the waters and will be gradually reversing that. But yes, um, good move on the eve of the climate summit and in the middle of a fishing dispute to fill the waters with sewage. Um, but this is an incredibly emotional issue. This is it, these sort of legendary romantic themes about ruling the seas and, and controlling who can go in and out of maritime borders. These are the kind of things that, that sort of get politicians roused, you know, rattled. And, and they're really going for it here because you've got the ambassador coming in um, for, for, you know, to get wrapped on the wrists. And, you know, unfortunately, as a result, also because of domestic politics in France, this is going to get drawn out. Out. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's an extraordinary story. Um, speaking of sewage uh, and health, <laughs> uh, uh, smoking. So we're on page one. Also, massive headline straight across the front page of The Guardian that says, NHS to prescribe e-cigarettes in radical plan to cut smoking rates. England, according to The Guardian, will become the first country in the world, the first health service globally to actually prescribe e-cigarettes. And, and I think this falls under the, d the department of if you live long enough, you see everything. Because you'll recall when e-cigarettes first burst onto the scene, they were deemed to be just as dangerous as tobacco. And, and the flavored uh, e-cigarettes were bad for children. And they were untested and nobody knew what they would do. And, and this was every bit as alarming as cigarettes themselves. And now you have the NHS actually saying, here, have some e-cigarettes. But um, what's emerged in ta over time is that this apparently is um, a reliable way to smoke less tobacco. And so 7%, um, The Guardian tells us, 7% of, of, of the UK um, vapes or uses some variety of e-cigarettes. And if you want to quit, you'll be able to go into your GP and he or she is going to give you a box of e-cigarettes to take away with you. Extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, let's go on to the FT, because this is about G20, as we were talking about uh, before uh, uh, on our top story. We were asking about vaccine delivery, and, and the FT follows up on that. That's right. This is quite extraordinary. We're going a little bit off piste here, because this isn't really a story in the FT. This is actually an advert placed a full page, massive advert on page seven of the pink paper, the FT. And the headline says, urgent call on the G20 for global vaccine delivery. And as you noted at the very top of the broadcast, one of the things that's going to be discussed at the G20 is trying to even out the incredible discrepancy between vaccination rates in the developed world and in the developing world. And so here you have a list of global leaders, both from the political world and from the business world with their pictures and their names and, and dozens and dozens of globally distinguished individuals. Individuals, um, including, you know, for example, Ban Ki Moon, the Secretary General of the United States until 2016. Gordon Brown is there. The former president of Brazil is there. Uh, the former prime minister of, of New Zealand, Helen Clark, has put her name to this. And they basically ask two things. Um, they say that the U.S., the EU, the U.K., and Canada will be stockpiling 240 million unused vaccines by the end of this month. And basically all of these leaders and more are saying, let them go, ship them somewhere else mm -hmm. in the world. And they're also asking for more money from the World Bank to make that happen. And, and who's actually placed the advert? Can you imagine what a logistical nightmare it must have been corralling all of those people to sign off on it? Well, exactly. There are literally, you know, there must be close to 100 different signatories here at the bottom of the page. Um, and, and this was done by um, a sort of media organization um, the, the Financial Times, actually, at the very bottom of the page, says that they donated the space on page seven of their global newspaper. At the top, it says advertisement. But at the bottom, they said it was done for free. Hmm, how interesting. All right. Finally, we've got time for one more story. It's not a game that I play. It's not a game that I understand. It's, to be frank, not a game I'm particularly interested in. Tell us about Bridge. You are going to be <laughs> interested in Bridge. And I have to, you know, I'm kind of keen to learn it and understand more. But this is also a front page story in the international edition of The New York Times. So you know it's important. Basically, there is a massive cheating scandal in online Bridge. And so the headline says, Top Bridge Play. Players 
demand crackdown on online cheats. And what the Times tells us is that people who used to play bridge in person would try to give each other signals by tapping their feet or coughing or something like that. Now what has happened as a result of the pandemic, bridge playing has moved massively online and players are just openly sort of texting each other and saying, here's my hand and these are the cards that I have, or they're sending each other emails and and it's blown open and the world of bridge is apparently on the verge of a massive scandal. Quel horreur. <laughs> Charles, thank you very much indeed. That was Charles Hecker from Controls. And I believe you're joining me on Saturday. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much to Charles. We'll take a break. UBS is a global financial services firm with over 150 years of heritage. Built on the unique dedication of our people, we bring fresh thinking and perspective to our work. We know that it takes a marriage of intelligence and heart to create lasting value for our clients. It's about having the right ideas, of course, but also about having one of the most accomplished systems and an unrivaled network of global experts. That's why at UBS, we pride ourselves on thinking smarter to make a real difference. Tune in to The Bulletin with UBS every week for the latest insights and opinions from UBS all around the world. This week, Iran hosted a regional conference of Afghanistan's neighbours. The Secretary General of the United Nations said that Afghanistan is currently in the middle of a massive humanitarian disaster while standing on the edge of a development catastrophe. The UN estimates that 10 million girls have yet to return to school in Afghanistan due to both the COVID-19 pandemic and the Taliban takeover two months ago. Well, Shukriya Barakzai is an Afghan women's rights advocate and a former politician who helped draft the country's constitution. Shukriya, I'd like to start by asking you to tell us your personal story. I start my career 23 years back from now when the first Taliban came, while they lashed me on the street and they beat me on the street. And after that, I stand up and I realized an educated woman, uh, as somebody who been in the university and today just on the street, being without men and visiting doctor, they punished me. And I start my, my goal from that day. It's almost near 23, more than 23 years. I start to run an underground school for the girls in my country in Kabul um, during uh, the Taliban first time. And later on, when the Taliban gone after 9-11 and all those stories I was been witnessing there, um, the new government came. The new settlement after Bonn Agreement, I start, my passion was, I was a journalist, and I start the publication with the name of Ayn Aizan. Very critical, very straightforward, very reformist, very feminist. And later on, I was been appointed to draft the constitution. So like the the real uh, match start when I start to draft the constitution for my country. I'm very proud with the, all the sacrifice and hard work at that time also was the same mentality was been holding the Afghan politics to have men to be happy the owner and also Mujahideens and other groups which they were been fighting against Soviet, the same kind of ideas as Taliban's are carrying. And I draft a constitution with a great privilege for women and with a very constructive discrimination for women, including reserve seats with the parliament. Two times I ran for the parliament successfully from Kabul province. I was of course beating lots of men during the death match. And uh, lately after uh, in 2014, the Taliban successfully, they planned so many attacks, but 2014 was the success one. Um, the suicide car bomb attack was on me, and miraculously I was been survived. And later on... And you were targeted specifically? Oh, yes. Them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't the first time. Even three days before Taliban came and take over Afghanistan, uh, Kabul, I mean, um, they, they, they attack again my car. But luckily, this time I was clever enough how to react. So lots of things happen in my life. But uh, the, the journey 
which is I was been made it in the 23 years. And today when I'm turning my back, I feel proud while I'm seeing the young generation raising their voices on the streets and asking for their rights. But meanwhile, it's hard for me to start again from the same scratch as 23 years back mm. for women's rights in education. Tell me about getting out of Kabul because you must have realized what was about to happen and, and that you needed to leave. The first hours they came, actually I was on my way uh, to for, for a medical reason, um, which is suddenly I was inside of the airport, the government changed. <laughs> That, that's that's unbelievable. I guess, but you know, you you can't imagine in a minute, in a second, in an hour, things change so rapidly. And I got a, a picture from my house that my friends she sent me say, "Oh, do you know Taliban was just right in your house and they looted? They were after me." Inside of the airport, where all this chaos and disaster. I was been exhausting, like, why are they off to me? So, well, that was another struggle inside of the airport. I changed the dress. I put so many layers on my face, mask and everything that my voice, my face, my name shouldn't be something to recognize for them because I was been always very outspoken as it is today I am. I'm also having at least minimum two, three to ten interviews per day with my own local media, debating with the Taliban and again beating them by polite way and words. So, um, which is finally I realized that uh, I cannot survive because they say that airport is safe, US troops are there. No, it wasn't safe. Mm. The Taliban came and they were following me. I joined the crowd. I contact uh, Honorable Dabi Ibrahim, um, MP here, a member of parliament. She was answered, replied on early Sunday morning, which is I'm grateful. And she cooperate with the um, another honorable Mr. Tom, that he is the head of foreign affairs committee and with the cooperation of Lord Tariq Ahmad. And of course, they ask some Uh, communication and cooperation with the U.S. military, which is they evacuated me. Mm. It's hard with the career I built in the last 23 years. My face, my voice, my name was a big threat at that time for yeah. me. You say that you're debating with the Taliban. Should we be debating with them? Should the West be engaging with the Taliban? Is that the only way forward? Um, to be honest, it's too early to ask for their recognition. But somehow being engaged and involved with them to make them accountable and hold them accountable, especially when it comes to humanitarian crisis at the moment in Afghanistan and delivering humanitarian aids to Afghanistan, it is very important somehow, not like with it as an official government or official. My debate with the Taliban is totally something different because no men and women have the courage to stand and make them correct in front of public eye. Mm. That's what I'm doing. And, and are they sticking to their pledges? I mean, they've said that, that, that girls can go to school, that women no, will have no, rights. No, 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 no. I, I, I couldn't believe from the very beginning, even like four years back when they say the Taliban changed. No, their mindset is the same. They will never let the girls to go to school unless there will be pressure on them. Unless they feel that girls are same as boys or women are same as men. You cannot believe more than one million women lost their jobs. The rate of employment is another catastrophe that women in Afghanistan and people in Afghanistan generally are facing. So what is the future for the country? How do we help? Well, definitely no one will let Afghanistan to be In, in that circumstances, for the time, the second evacuation phase is important because Taliban are after people such as female judges, women's rights activists, journalists, former military people, those translator work with the United Kingdom and delivering the humanitarian aids through to the international organization, to the local organization, which is they should hire back the women with the engagement of Taliban for the distribution, the um, humanitarian aid. And to be honest, 
if we like them or not, they are the reality, but this is important to hold them accountable. I think there are countries which is they have enough influence on the Taliban. We can use those countries as a tool of power. Like Pakistan, for Like instance. Pakistan, like Qatar. Um, well, these days, uh, the Chinese are very willing uh, to showing very much great relationship with the Taliban. But unfortunately, of course, the women's rights, human rights um, is, is not the matter for Chinese or having an inclusive government. Chinese are after what is the virginity of Afghanistan. It's the natural resources. Mm. They are after natural resources. They are after connectivity in Afghanistan. They are after all their own political agenda in Afghanistan. And what about your personal future? Well, I'm not the one to give up. No matter how hard is life, no matter how I've always been struggling, I will not give up. I have a duty and responsibility, and that's my obligation to stand for the women's rights and human rights, democracy in Afghanistan. I believe our allies, such as United Kingdom, US, and all other allies should also feel the same as I do. We are responsible to those 35 million people that we've been preaching them for 20 years with the great slogan of democracy and development and prosperity. Shukriya, many thanks. That was Shukriya Barakzai. You're listening to The Globalist on Monocle 24. I'm Georgina Godwin, and it's time to talk business now with Tola Onanuga, who is the weekend business editor at The Insider. Good morning to you, Tola. Good morning. How are uh, you? I'm very good, but the US growth is not so great. It's slowing. Yes, that's right. So uh, the latest data about the health of the US economy isn't great, and it's certainly not what many obser- observers had hoped for. So in the three months to September, it did slow to 2%. And this has largely been blamed on the Delta variant of COVID-19. So the link to Delta is really interesting because what this means in practice is that some crucial parts of the economy, uh, such as the services sector and also the events industry, had to delay their reopening. Um, and obviously, these both of those sectors are quite big drivers of growth in the US. And so it's not a great picture overall for um, for business owners, but also for consumers. But there is a ray of light in the fact that uh, COVID infections are falling across the US. And so many observers do think that growth is going to pick up in line with those decreases. Mm, But we're seeing inflation at 5.4 percent, or at least that was the figure in September. And also, of course, this huge global supply chain problem. Yes, yes, exactly. So the supply chain is not really getting any better. I mean, there are now measures in place to try and tackle it by the US administration. But we're kind of seeing a limited effect in that at the moment. And I think it is only going to get worse in the run up to Christmas. Yeah. Uh, Well, let's have a look at Biden's spending then in the light of that. Yes. So uh, so Biden has been trying to push through this huge spending package. And one of the highlights of that uh, was the uh, emphasis on climate change and how he's planning to spend hundreds of billions of dollars Um, on tackling the climate issue. Uh, So some of the measures include um, providing more clean energy schemes, uh, more electric vehicles, more flood defences linked to extreme weather events. So the administration say that this amount of spending will result in the largest effort to combat climate change in American history. So that is a very significant move. There are some critics that people do say that, you know, if the plan goes ahead, it doesn't go far enough. Um, It doesn't include any mechanisms to reduce fossil fuel usage and it doesn't penalise the big energy companies that traditionally have contributed significantly to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, will you be my meta friend? (laughs) <laughs> I will indeed, yes. So um, so this is obviously linked to Facebook. Um, there's been days of anticipation about Facebook's new name. So it revealed last night that it was changing its corporate name to Meta. Um, this basically it follows on from Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO's approach uh, to Facebook's future. He says he wants to build a metaverse. And what this means is that people will essentially be able to uh, communicate and interact in a digital space using avatars. Um, the na- I would say that the announcement has been met. It's had mixed results. You know, some people are a bit confused about what this means for the long term. 
other people are kind of, you know, optimistic about, you know, this maybe could be a new era for Facebook. It has been, you know, beleaguered by many sort of, you know, claims of whist- from whistleblowers in recent weeks. So this could be a way to turn things around. But I think it's going to be a case of just watching the space and seeing what happens. And it looks to me also a, a way to kind of change the demographic because Facebook users seem to be generally uh, much older. Uh, but but those yeah. people possibly may not understand the metaverse. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I do think that's true. Um, we've seen, you know, with the whistleblower claims, I think one of the things that came out was that the younger re- uh, user- usership uh, for Facebook has been massively falling sort of over time. And so they are kind of desperate to try and reclaim, you know, this kind of young user base. But again, we don't know at this stage whether that's going to be successful or not. Yeah. Uh, and finally, a quick look at Amazon's results. Yes. So both um, Amazon and Apple have uh, report- reported quite disappointing quarterly results. And again, this is linked to the global supply chain crisis, which is, as I said, is still having a significant effect on um, companies across the world. But I think what is kind of worrying here is the fact that even this shows that even the biggest companies, you know, these are among the biggest companies in the world, um, and they're not immune to this crisis. So while I do think, you know, the likes of Apple and Amazon can bounce back from this, it's more worrying for the smaller businesses who don't have the same resources and they may face things like reputational damage Mm. along with many other issues if they can't get their products into the hands of consumers. Tola, thank you very much indeed. That was Tola Onanuga. And this is The Globalist on Monocle 24. And it's time now to hand over to our contributing editor, Andrew Muller, for his weekly reflection on the news cycle. We learned this week that the Ohio Bureau of Motor Vehicles does not know enough about the early history of powered flight. The Buckeye State unveiled new license plates declaring Ohio birthplace of aviation, with that slogan depicted on a banner flying behind a representation of Flyer One, the pioneering aircraft built by Wilbur and Orville Wright, bicycle mechanics of Dayton, Ohio, and stick with us, this is worth it eventually. However, fooled by the fact that Flyer One had propellers at the rear and ailerons at the front, Ohio's cartoonist placed the banner not in the right place, but the wrong one. Hey, just getting started. Arguably more amusingly, we learned that this mishap had reignited Ohio's rivalry with North Carolina vis-a-vis which is the real birthplace of the aeroplane. For while the Wrights were assuredly from Ohio, they first took Flyer 1 airborne in 1903 near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And we learned that as social media chortlers piled in on Ohio's drafting error, North Carolina's Department of Transport was unable to rise above joining the mockery, tweeting as follows, as read by Monocle 24's state rivalries desk chief, Christy Evans. You'll leave Ohio alone. They wouldn't know. They weren't there. And that is Ohio's official state rock song, Hang On Sloopy by the McCoys, as played by the Ohio State University marching band in the background. Some of us do our research. We also learned, and conclusively so, that if people are not enticed by the offer of a free, safe protection against the worst ravages of a potentially fatal disease, they're not going to be enticed by much. Bothans at the National Bureau of Economic Research in the US. Actually, can we have a round of applause for the word boffins? It's a good word, is boffins. Boffins. The friendless poindexters at the NBER, we learned, have been having a look into vaccine incentives. In various places around the world, these have included, but been by no means limited to, cash, lottery tickets, concert tickets, holiday vouchers, a chance to win a car in a raffle, beer, marijuana, fishing licenses, pickled herring, popcorn, chickens, and in Finland... Buckets. Yeah, my bucket's got a hole in it. 
Here is Monocle 24's Bucket Desk Chief, Marcus Hippie, explaining the last of these with all the innate and irrepressible exuberance for which his people are famed. I am from Finland. We are very fond of buckets in Finland. Nothing brings us greater joy than buckets. I'm right now beside myself with delirium merely thinking about my bucket. Anyway, we learned from the NBER's report that none of it makes much difference, so we would appear to have learned a reiteration of the lesson that there is no reasoning with the unreasonable. That said, upon scrutinising the fine print of the NBER's conclusions, we learned that they'd only scrutinised one region in California, where one possibly clinching sweetener had not been offered. Everybody loves buckets. They should promise them buckets. But we learned that opportunities await the vaccine hesitant in the United States, other of course than the opportunity for one of those ruinously expensive stays in hospital upon which Americans insist. Ooh. Edgy. Yes, if you are sceptical of evidence and unwilling to act in the public good, you can be a police officer in Florida, where you might one day even feature in a whimsical news review such as this, should you, for example, end up in a freeway chase with a naked drunk on a Segway with a stolen alligator under one arm, which is the kind of thing which does seem to happen in Florida to a perhaps disproportionate extent. Ron DeSantis, governor of the, and finally, state, will even pay you to move there. Our $5,000 bonus, that applies to anyone. I mean, you know, if you're in NYPD and you're not getting the support you need and you, you're, you're qualified, you come down here, you're going to get a bonus because we've got your back and it's a way to say thank you. $5,000, you could buy a lot of buckets with that. We learn that there is one jurisdiction on Earth clearly even less fussy than Florida about who it hires to protect and serve. It is the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, designated as of this monologue the Florida of India, where the local wallopers arrested three Kashmiri Muslim students in Agra for exchanging WhatsApp messages celebrating India's defeat by Pakistan in a cricket match. The trio have been charged with promoting enmity and cyber terrorism. Oh, gone, surely gone, yes, absolutely done. There are a few things that all concerned should bear in mind here. One, first and foremost, is that this is obviously idiotic and Uttar Pradesh's finest should take a long and rigorous look at themselves. Another is that Pakistan's 10-wicket trouncing of India occurred in a game of T20 cricket, a trivial, footling and undignified barbarism, nothing to do with real cricket, a format of interest only to children and simpletons. And another, possibly self-interested, is that criminalising this kind of behaviour elsewhere in the world could have woeful consequences for, for example, Australians who find themselves living in England during the Looming Ashes series. For Monocle 24, I'm Andrew Muller. That's Andrew Muller, the Australian, living in London. And, of course, the ashes are rapidly approaching. That's all for today's programme. Be afraid, Andrew, be very afraid. Thanks to our producers, Rhys James, Daniel Bates, Paige Reynolds and Charlie Phil McCourt. Our researchers, Sophie Monaghan-Coombs and Lillian Fawcett. And our studio manager, Chris Blackwell, with editing assistance from Christy Evans. After the headlines, there's more music on the way and the briefing is live at midday in London. I'm Georgina Godwin. I'll return on the globe. Globalist at the same time on Monday. Thank you for listening.